。大家好，我是中国物流与采购联合会冷链物流专业委员会的赵一宁，非常欢迎大家参加今天下午的研讨会。纵观全球主要的生鲜物流枢纽，荷兰不容小觑。荷兰国土面积仅四点二万平方公里，是一个名副其实的小国土大农业国家。然而，它在全球生鲜品贸易以及分销领域占据重要地位。物流是生鲜供应链的重要支撑，任何国家和国际生鲜业务的运营都离不开物流的支持。荷兰是仅次于美国的全球第二大食品出口国，地处欧洲交通重要枢纽位置，拥有全球领先的基础设施、创新理念以及商业活力。高达百分之四十的中国出口货物都要途经荷兰。而荷兰在生鲜供应链领域也堪称世界第一。今年第十二届全球食品冷链物流峰会，中国物流与采购联合会冷链物流专业委员会非常有幸邀请到荷兰国际物流协会、荷兰基础设施与水管理部以及荷兰领馆成为会议支持方。今天第十二届全球食品冷链物流峰会评清论坛三：全球生鲜枢纽荷兰专题论坛。我们将从科研创新到商业案例。三百六十度全景呈现荷兰生鲜供应链全貌。随后的我们实时互动问答环节，来自荷兰的专家也将解答大家关于荷兰生鲜供应链领域方面的任何问题。Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this digital breakout session about temperature-controlled food supply chains, during which experiences from the Netherlands will be shared. My name is Remco Buurman, and I'm the CEO. Of the Holland International Distribution Council. Unfortunately, it's not possible to be at the conference in person because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But I'm glad we are able to do it this way. And our Chinese representative, Mrs. Shirley Yang, is at the conference, so please contact her in case you have any questions. First, I would like to thank the Cold Chain Logistics Committee of the China Federation of Logistics and Purchasing. For inviting the Holland International Distribution Council as a supporting organization for this 2020 12th Global Supply Chain Summit, and I would like to thank the Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management for supporting this breakout session. The COVID-19 pandemic has a great impact on our personal lives and on economic activities all over the world. Also, the logistics industry has been affected. In the Netherlands, we have seen a mixed picture for logistic companies, depending on the market segment they are active in. Some segments are actually doing very well, like life sciences, e-commerce, and also agrofood. The Netherlands is considered as the European logistics hub for agrofood. The Netherlands is the second largest exporter of agrofood in the world and the largest importer of agrofood in Europe. Main reasons are the central location in Europe. The presence of main entry points to Europe, with the port of Rotterdam and Schiphol Airport, excellent interland connections, and the largest concentration of cold storage facilities in Europe. Today, we have an excellent lineup of experts who want to share their knowledge and experience of cold chain logistics in the Netherlands from a different perspective. China has a huge market potential for the further development of cold chain logistics. I hope the presentations will offer some new insights, and I hope that this breakout session will contribute to the further cooperation between the Netherlands and China. I wish you good health. Enjoy the presentations. Holland International Logistics Council is Holland's only non-governmental non-profit organization. The support of the Holland government and Holland logistics industry has been provided by 300 companies and organizations and support. The solution to the problem of the high-tech manager Jasper will share with the Holland Supply Chain Holding Company. Hello and warm welcome from the Netherlands. My name is Jasper Echtlein. I'm Senior Manager of Supply Chain Solutions at the Holland International Distribution Council. Today, during my presentation, I will tell you why the Netherlands is the main logistics hub for agri-food products. Well, the Netherlands is the main logistics hub for agri-food uh, products for a number of key reasons. We have the highest share in agri and food import and export flows. We have a central location within the European consumer market. We have excellent connectivity to Europe and all other continents. We have the highest concentration of cold storage in Europe, a world-class fiscal and business environment. We provide value-added logistics for agri and food products. And according to various independent studies, 
our logistics is at the highest quality at competitive costs. So don't take my word for it. Uh, the Netherlands has been recognized by world-renowned uh, institutions as a model country uh, for logistics. For example, the European Commission has recognized the Netherlands for its transport capabilities and infrastructure. The World Economic Forum and IMB, both world-renowned institutions, ranked the Dutch port infrastructure as number one globally. And DHL, which is the largest forwarder globally, has recognized the Netherlands as the most connected country. These achievements are a result of being the European gateway for many years. And the Dutch government and the logistics industry work together to keep this position for the future. <clears throat> when we look at the import figures, we see that the Netherlands is the main importer of agri and food into Europe uh, at 30 million tons. Um, most of these products uh, are uh, shipped directly to European destinations, but many products uh, undergo some type of transformation or uh, alterations such as processing, reconditioning, packing, labeling, um, or combining different products for retail packaging. When we switch to export, we see that the Netherlands is the second largest export of agri-food products in the world, which is quite an achievement uh, because we are such a small country. Uh, for decades, the Dutch agricultural sector has succeeded in maintaining this lead over international competitors through continual investment in innovation in agri-food value chains. The Netherlands combines um, major domestic uh, production uh, with a trade hub. Uh, actually, we control about 50% of the world cut uh, flour market. And the Netherlands is the biggest exporter of fresh, fresh, fresh vegetables and we are the European fruit hub. The fruit and vegetable cluster in the Netherlands is worth almost 14 billion euros. And in 2018, the agricultural exports was 90 billion and our main agricultural export partners were Germany, Belgium, UK, France, and Italy in the European Union. I also mentioned that we have a favorable geographic position. Well, we are situated right in between the main European consumer markets, being Germany, UK, France, and the Benelux. And these regions are within a day's reach. If you take a circumference of 500 kilometers around the Netherlands, you can reach 170 million consumers. If you expand that circumference to 1,000 kilometers, you can reach 244 million consumers. And this represents the bulk of EU spending power. So if you are entering the European market and want to sell your agri-food products, you want to reach these 244 million consumers as quickly as possible. And the Netherlands, with the central locations, can do just that. The Dutch ports are the largest in Europe for all categories of goods, including agri and food. The port of Rotterdam has the highest share of container handling, supported by an excellent reefer infrastructure. The Dutch seaports offer a lot of opportunities for the handling and processing of containerized agri uh, and food products. The port of Amsterdam, for example, is the largest cacao port in the world. The port of Rotterdam has excellent reefer infrastructure. Um, Zeeland seaports is very strong in onions, bananas, fruit juices, meat and fish. And Groningen seaports is a large bio-based port. So now you know that uh, the port of Rotterdam is the largest port in Europe. It has the highest share of container handling. Um, and it is a deep sea port, which means that the port does not have any draft limitations. So the largest container vessels in the world can enter the port fully loaded uh, and can be accommodated 24 seven. The total throughput in 2017 exceeded 13.5 million TEU. Amsterdam Airport is the main European perishables hub. Uh, and it is the third largest airport in Europe in terms of cargo volume. Um, and it's also the global flower hub. Uh, so when the flowers are traded in the morning, they're on an airplane immediately. Uh, and Amsterdam Airport offers 322 direct destinations to 95, 95 countries globally. The Netherlands uh, also offers multimodal uh, transport uh, opportunities through uh, railroad, waterway, and short sea. Uh, so when you are designing your European supply chain, you can benefit from all these different modalities, meaning that you're very flexible in designing your supply chain in Europe. And besides uh, having a favorable geographic location right in the middle of the consumer markets, the Netherlands has another geographical advantage, and that is that we are in a delta. 
the rivers that flow through the Netherlands flow all the way to the hinterland of Europe. And we use these waterways for transporting goods to and from the main ports. And when you look uh, along these waterways, you will see that there have been a lot of rail and barge terminals established along the waterways. And these terminals have reefer plugins to allow for cold chain operations. And close to these terminals, you will find the main logistics hub with the European distribution centers uh, that handle agri-food logistics. These inland locations are excellently positioned for the, for the distribution, production of, or processing of food, as both bulk and containerized food can be shipped very efficiently to the European hinterland. I also mentioned that uh, the Netherlands offers the highest uh, cold storage in Europe. Actually, we have the highest capacity per urban residence of cold storage in the world at one cubic meter uh, per, uh, per inhabitant. And most of this uh, cold storage uh, capacity is used for Europe instead of only for the domestic market. Food that uh, comes in from overseas and is destined for European consumers Consumers often need to go through some transformation or alteration. Some fruit, for example, need to be ripened before it's ready to be sold. Containers with agricultural products might be contaminated and need to be fumigated, or products that are packed in bulk need to be packed in consumer packaging ready for supermarket shelves. Many of these value-added logistics uh, services are offered by our logistics companies in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, when you come to the Netherlands, I'm happy to show you uh, these companies so you can see the processes that are already active in the Netherlands. Now let's take a look at uh, VAT attractiveness. Uh, European VAT um, is a consumption tax on all goods and services within the European Union. There is no central European institution that collects value-added tax. Instead, all the European member states individually collect value-added tax. And the value-added tax rate differs among the different uh, European member states. For example, the VAT rate in Luxembourg, 70%. Uh, but the fat rate of Hungary is 27 percent. Um, the VAT rate, by the way, in the Netherlands is 21 percent. And the VAT administration can be quite a burden on your business because how it's dealt with varies uh, among the European member states. Deloitte has researched the VAT attractiveness uh, among the uh, European member states and has concluded that the Netherlands offers the most comprehensive and business-friendly implementation of VAT among all the European member states. This analysis has been done uh, on 14 different elements, uh, such as VAT filing period, complexity of VAT returns, VAT grouping, payments of VAT refunds, deferment of import VAT, and VAT bad debt relief. VAT deferment is an uh, important reason why a lot of companies choose the Netherlands as a, com a country to import goods into the European Union. Normally, when you import your goods into Europe, you need to pay VAT at import. The Netherlands actually allows you to postpone the payment of import VAT until you sell your products. This is done under License 23. And being allowed to postpone your VAT at import provides quite a considerable cash flow advantage. And when you sell your products cross-border within Europe to another business, you're allowed, under certain circumstances, to invoice a European customer with a 0% VAT rate. And that makes you, as a supplier, very attractive to European customers because you are not asking your European customer to pre-finance FAT either. And, best of all, you can be completely FAT compliant without even opening a local entity. You can appoint a fiscal representative, which in most cases can be your logistics service provider, um, but if your service provider does not offer this uh, VAT deferment uh, service, the Holland International Distribution Council can introduce you to an independent fiscal representative that it can take care of your FAT compliancy. Uh, contrary to VAT, uh, import duties are an actual cost, um, and the import duty rate is the same in every EU country. Um, but there is a way to place your goods within the European territory without uh, paying the import duties at import. Um, in China, you have um, free trade zones, uh, While well, the system in the Netherlands is the same, so uh, as in a free trade zone, you can place your goods into the territory without having your goods custom cleared yet. But in the Netherlands, it's not restricted geographically, uh, but it can be in a bonded warehouse 
all over the country, as long as the warehouse is an economic, an authorized economic operator. Um, the advantage of bonded warehousing in the Netherlands, as opposed to other European countries, is that in the Netherlands, the bonded warehousing is for an unlimited period of time. Um, and in other European countries, after, for example, in Germany, after one year, you have to custom clear your goods. But in the Netherlands, you can store your goods under a bond for an unlimited period of time. And you are allowed to conduct value-added logistics while the product is still on the bond. So in the agri-food supply chain, we see that, for example, quality control is carried out in a bonded warehouse before the goods are placed in free circulation. Um, so in the end, it makes sure that you are only paying import duties for products that have the quality that you need to sell on the European market. So you're not uh, importing uh, rotten uh, products. The Netherlands is a small country, but we have a major goods flow. Uh, so it's very crucial that imports and exports are dealt with in a very efficient manner. The Dutch customs are highly developed and digitized, even allowing customs clearance before the goods enter the country. To ensure everything keeps running smoothly, the Dutch customs authorities also employ dedicated teams of experienced specialists who can assign client managers to individual companies. Most of the logistics companies in the country are authorized economic operators that have direct digital links with customs. As a result, in 2016, the United Nations declared the Dutch customs to be the most trade facilitating in the world. This research looked at the various factors influencing trade facilitation, such as transparency, number of formalities, institutional arrangement and cooperation, paperless trade facilitation, and cross-border paperless trade. The Netherlands is really regarded as a model custom, a country for customs around the world. And the Netherlands is a very easy, uh, uh, easy place for doing business. Uh, according to the IMD, the Netherlands provides the highest ease of doing business in Europe. And according to many business leaders, the Netherlands offers a very favorable business environment. When you come to the Netherlands, you will encounter a very modern society um, where equality and hard work is very much appreciated. It's a very multicultural environment, which makes it very easy for experts to adapt. And one of the reasons it's very easy to adapt in the Netherlands is because of our language skills. 90% um, of the Dutch population speaks English fluently. And additionally, we speak another third language, mostly German, Spanish or French. Um, and I've even encountered uh, Chinese speaking uh, staff at our logistics companies in Netherlands. And that makes it very easy to do business um, and very easy to communicate with each other. Tracking and tracing is also very important, uh, especially in the agri-food sector, sector to ensure quality and availability. So we like to trace uh, the products from farm to fork. Um, we offer a high degree of visibility uh, throughout the supply chain, so you can plan your production and distribution better and monitor your product quality very well. We have mastered the tracing of products and used the technology that we have developed in the Netherlands for controlling the global supply chain. According to independent consultants, setting up an agri-food distribution center in the Netherlands offers best value for money. This research has looked at five cost factors and 28 quality factors for 18 different locations throughout Western Europe. The benchmark has been performed from a source to market business perspective based on a real life case. The results of the cost, cost quality review in the benchmark analysis has been reviewed against the supply chain drives of the agri-food industry. You can find the complete benchmark at the website of the Holland International Distribution Council or in the Holland Logistics Library. And you see that quite a lot of Dutch locations outrank European locations for setting up agri-food logistics. And that's why many overseas multinational corporations have established major logistics facilities in the Netherlands, emphasizing the competitiveness of the Netherlands for agri-food logistics. And I'm sure that these um, brands are well known to you. The Holland International Distribution Council is a private public non-profit organization. We have been founded by the Dutch logistics industry 30 years ago, and we represent more than 300 members, of which about 160 are uh, logistics companies. We promote the Netherlands as a gateway to Europe, and we 
work very closely with the Netherlands Foreign Investment Agency. And you will find the Netherlands Foreign Investment Agency in China in the Dutch consulates. Our service involves providing advice on cost-effective and agile setup of European supply chain. We have a logistics background, so we can share our knowledge and expertise with you. Um, we provide a matchmaking service, so um, according to your logistics needs, we can select a number of logistics uh, companies that can handle your needs and your products. And when you travel to the Netherlands, we can arrange a fact-finding. I will actually pick you up from the airport or from the hotel, and we will visit the logistics companies for a discussion and a warehouse tour, which will really help you narrow down your search to select the best logistics company or logistics partner for your business. And the best thing about our service is we provide our service free of charge. We provide neutral advice. It does not create any obligation whatsoever. And if you prefer, our service can be completely confidential. So if you are looking for a logistics partner for your European supply chain, please contact us. We are ready to assist you. I'm based in the Netherlands, uh, but I work closely together with my colleague Shirley Yan, who is based in Chongqing in China. Um, and our contact details are uh, on this slide. So feel free to contact us via mobile phone, email, or WeChat. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. And I look forward to uh, meeting you in the Netherlands and showing us, or showing you all the logistics capabilities that we have on offer. Thank you. 乌特丹港处于欧洲贸易的中心 Welcome to the presentation of Support of Rotterdam. My name is Anna Cyrus and I'm the business manager at AgroFood. If we talk about AgroFood, we talk about fruit, vegetables, meat, fish and dairy, and other fresh and frozen food products. Before we start, I would like to thank the Global Cold Chain Summit and the Holland International Distribution Council for hosting this webinar and enabling us to join the summit virtually. Let me start to give you a short introduction into the agro-food segment. Um, frozen and, and perishable cargo require time-efficient and responsive supply chain. On one hand, this is due to the changing consumer patterns. On the other hand, uh, seasonality and global sourcing play a role here. Over the years, we have seen a shift from conventional reefer vessels, where the cargo was transported on the decks, uh, and handled um, uh, through cranes like you can see in the picture, where now 95% of the cargo is being containerized into reefer containers. Of the total container business, uh, agrofood accounts for about 14% of the containers. And we expect that this percentage will be growing. This is due to the increasing population, worldwide population, but also to changing consumer patterns. The whole industry, the whole reefer market is growing. You see this also in the investments that terminals and carriers have done in their reefer equipment, like reefer plugs and reefer um, containers, but also in the increase of cold storages, uh, especially in and around Rotterdam. If you look at our annual throughput, which is approximately 60 million tons in 2019, um, approximately half of this is the, done by the category fruit and vegetables, and the other half is meat, fish, and dairy. The import flows are largely dominated by the import of fruit and vegetables, whereas the export flow is more dominated by the meat, fish, and dairy. As you can see, the export has been increasing uh, quite significantly over the last years, and we expect an annual uh, growth of 5% in the next five years. When we look at the uh, imported products, um, uh, citrus, bananas and grapes and avocados are our main import products, especially avocados have increased um, significantly over the last years. These products are also, when you go to supermarkets, uh, have the largest 
shelf space, uh, and this cannot be any surprise. Look at the export products, it's a slightly different picture. Frozen vegetables, um, which largely originate from Holland and from Belgium, are exported the most. These also include the French fries and chips, which are exported all over the world. Um, pr product, products like uh, onions and potatoes uh, are also very important in our export flows, whereas also meat, uh, poultry, uh, but also typical products like Dutch cheese and herring are exported. When we look at the global uh, sourcing and, and most important export countries, um, you can see quite a significant uh, difference between those. Um, fruit production countries like South Africa, Brazil, but also other countries in Latin and South America um, are in our top 10 of most important import countries. Whereas the export mostly goes to Asia, uh, the Middle East, but also to countries in Western Africa where a lot of the uh, potatoes and onions are being exported to. From a global perspective, we now zoom in into the port of Rotterdam. Here you can see the dark gray area is the port area, which is approximately uh, 12,000 hectares. I have here on this picture uh, highlighted the um, uh, facilities that are most important for the agro-food segment. To start with the container terminals, the orange dots on the uh, western part of the port, which we call the mass fluctor and is the reclaimed land. Here at the mass fluctor, the container terminals can handle uh, container vessels up to almost 24,000 TEU, um, and these container terminals uh, operates 24-7. The lighter blue dots uh, on, on both on the western side and on the eastern side of the port are the cold store operators. Um, in the port we have several locations um, of um, cold store operators like Argo Merchants, Eurofrigo and Kloosterboer. In the most eastern part uh, we also have in the northern side the, mo uh, the old fruit port, as we call it. These, are, uh, these terminals still handle conventional vessels. Also there we have the juice cluster, um, which contains the juice terminal of continental juice, which is part of Quetuale, handling uh, orange juice in bulk. The dark blue dots are the robo terminals or the ferry terminals. From here, the ferries mostly to the UK and to Ireland uh, depart. These are very important because uh, the green area, which are the green ports, as you can see, we are located in the middle of them. In these green ports, a lot of the trade, uh, trade companies and um, uh, companies connected to the retailers, that supply the retailers, are located. So a lot of the imported products, the fruit comes in, goes to either a cold store in the port or to one of the green ports, are being often packed, uh, labeled, um, ripened sometimes, and from there are being transported into the European hinterland or via the robo terminals to the UK or Ireland. On the western side, you can also see our latest development, which is the Rotterdam Food Hub. I will go a bit further into this on the next slide. The Rotterdam Food Hub is our latest development. It's a 60 hectare plot um, which is fully destined for the agro-food segment. It's a plot which has uh, key sites on both on the north side and on the south side for deep sea vessels, uh, but also barges. Um, it's supposed to be a reefer hub with all the facilities, also like customs um, and empty depots. The um, companies that will locate here can be cold store operators, um, but also shippers or producers that would like to um, set up their own location. For instance, Innocent, being a producer of smoothies and juices, are setting up a location here which is fully climate neutral to blend, to bottle uh, their own smoothies and juices and to supply the retail into the hinterland.
Besides investing in physical infrastructure, we also invest into digital infrastructure. Um, this is an example of cargo track is an example of uh, a track and trace tool that we have developed and now integrated into our port community system. Um, when you order a, uh, a pizza or a meal or a pair of shoes online, you can follow it from the moment it leaves its warehouse to the moment it arrives at your door. However, if you order a container of pizzas or of shoes, um, it's a black box. This is due because a lot of parties are involved and it's not a transparent process. With Cargo Tracker, we have aimed to set up a track and trace tool where you can um, trace your container from the moment um, it arrives into the port, when the container is discharged onto the terminal and it leaves the terminal via the gate. With this tool, you can, um, with, and being able to trace the, the container, you can plan your own logistics much more efficiently and therefore get cost savings. With this presentation, I hope to have given you a, a good insight into the agro food activities in the Port of Rotterdam. I would like to thank you for your attention and I hope to see you later at the Q&A session. Thank you very much. 2000年,荷兰政府指定组建了园艺产业集群绿港。绿港是由企业、教育机构以及政府共同成立。绿港集群不仅是产业功能在空间上的高度集中,更是社会关系和知识交流的集群。目前,荷兰六个绿港其定位
but also in the logistics a lot of things develop he got nice warehouse we got containers 50 years ago we got long trucks and nowadays companies uh, are uh, developing and working and trying out with zero electric and hydrogen trucks because we have to distribute our uh, food in a clean way towards distribution centers and also towards the stores uh, in the metro metropolitans okay that was uh, a little bit about the history what about uh, uh, the locations and we start at the, at the global level uh, uh, as you see here we are located in uh, northwest europe uh, uh, and with it where 60 70 percent of the vegetables are grown in our own locations out of the season we get the vegetables from the south from spain and uh, the south of europe uh, and from north africa Fruits are coming from uh, South America, South Africa, or the middle of Americas. Uh, food is really also the whole year going through, depending on the type of food you are getting, eh? blueberries, avocados, bananas, whatever. Uh, in the global thing, uh, 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 what you see is that we, as the Netherlands, uh, we export to our close neighbor, so uh, uh, close by just 100 kilometers, around 5 billion euro of in value on fruit and vegetables each year. That's a statistic of the Rainbow Bank. And then focus from global towards uh, Europe, your new region. What you see here is our reason of existence. This is important, talking about hubs. Uh, here you see in the orange circle, it's uh, uh, 20 million people in North Heimersfalen, a state in Germany. Here we see the production area in the southeast of Holland I was talking about. Also is the Fresh Park uh, developed 50 years ago. But you also have these parks in the west of Holland, like ABC Westland. And the, the third important thing is our connections with uh, the ports, because import is also as important as this. Uh, so the ports of Rotterdam and Antwerp, as you can see here. Uh, uh, Fresh Park, you see the hub here, it's like a fresh consolidation center, because uh, all the loads that, that can go directly, as they call them, full truck loads. Uh, but if you need to consolidate, you work via a consolidation center or a hub. Um, uh, Focusing further down at, on the uh, uh, location, uh, and this is local, I'm talking about the region of Venlo itself. Uh, we are also part of Greenport Venlo. And Greenport Venlo, uh, as of 20 years ago, the Dutch government talked about the green ports in Holland. Uh, that's important uh, to, to talk about uh, uh, the developments of these hubs. But what do we do in a green port like Greenport Venlo? We have all kinds of companies, uh, uh, but uh, that, that means logistic companies, food companies, uh, provincial and local organizations, uh, authorities, national institutes. But the main thing you do together in such a platform is to keep our infrastructure optimal. Because the most important thing of a hub is a good infrastructure. Both the highways as the roads directing towards the highways. Uh, the railways, uh, we have two terminals here, one terminal directly. Uh, they have five shuttles a day towards uh, Rotterdam. Uh, uh, we have a new terminal being built. Uh, with uh, shuttles also from Rotterdam Antwerp, but also what important here is the shuttles going outward into Europe, right? because here you can load intercontinental containers, uh, cooled, conditioned, that can go into Europe. And of course, you can see that here we have the river and we have the barge terminal, uh, with which uh, a lot of reefers uh, uh, with the avocados or the uh, uh, um, blueberries uh, or mangoes are coming from uh, middle and south of America. So you can, they can come on a sustainable way up to the park. Uh, zooming further down towards the, the park, well, you see here a kind of a master plan. It's, uh, uh, you see the park, 130, 135 hectares. Uh, you see the, uh, the buildings in blue and in uh, orange. You see the, the, the green plots. Uh, you see some purple locations that is infrastructure, but also water buffers. Water is, uh, we get extreme, more extreme weather. So you have to be uh, ready to, to handle all those things. Uh, and what we are doing now is a lot of renovation also on the park itself. So because some of the buildings are brand new, but we also still have buildings from the early 1960s. The zoning plan around such a master plan is very important because you have to be able to act quickly if you get questions from new from tenants or from new prospects that you can be able to start building quite quickly. And uh, if you have a good zoning plan, you really should be able to start building after signing a contract within uh, eight to 10 weeks. Okay, what's going on on a hub like this? What's really happening? Uh, said uh, it, it's a consolidation uh, center. Um, so what's happening here? That there is trading, but more and more we see service provided. And the reason is on the left side you see producers, mainly of course producers, 
out of the big region in Holland, but also you can be avocado growers from Mexico. And on the right side, you have the retail and food service uh, companies and that a lot of has to do with Germany, but also that is mainly 70, 80% is that our market, but also other parts of Europe, of course. Uh, as said, uh, service providing is uh, uh, becoming more important than trade because retail and producers have uh, um, agreements with each other. Uh, so then the service provider ex executes the fresh supply chain. Uh, that means packaging things, quality controls, because things come here in bulk, for, for instance, blueberries, and here they make everything ready, uh, package it on the exact question that retail or food service has is just before market, just before coming on market. Also, of course, uh, things like processing is getting more and more important because uh, consumers want convenience. And what we uh, facilitate here in the park is supporting activities uh, like the cleaning companies, temporary employment agencies, small maintenance companies. Uh, we even have a kindergarten and also uh, conference uh, rooms. Uh, our business model is uh, quite straightforward. Uh, uh, we develop warehouses, so uh, that means uh, and processing facilities, uh, also premises for supporting activities. If we uh, don't have them uh, getting, if you don't get them free from other tenants, or you don't have them uh, if they want to get bigger, we do that. Uh, we don't have a building company ourselves, but we do that via uh, vendor processes. Then, of course, we have uh, uh, facilities available, and we can uh, rent them, uh, even cold stores for a week period. We have office space, flexible space. It's very important. Then we are uh, doing park management, like 24-7 security. We have, to, we have to keep the food park very clean. We are responsible for the infra because the our roads, our parking, the glass fiber, and also uh, around buildings. We have a lot of building maintenance services. Uh, and you can imagine we have uh, thousands of dogs and doors here. Uh, we also don't do that ourselves. That's all outsourced in, in this respect. And we are doing this with a team of about eight to nine people, of course, with a backup of the people on the investment side from uh, uh, our mother company, Heinz. Uh, to give you an insight on the type of uh, uh, activities, and I'm refer to square meters, uh, almost half of it, we're talking about trade and service providing, as I explained in that figure, but uh, that is for the big uh, uh, retail uh, and food service companies, but also for smaller supermarkets, the markets in Germany and the, in the EU region, uh, um, you can buy here also just boxes, a couple of boxes, and that's the cash and carry market. So they come here and get it with the buses and go away, or they order it here and it's brought there. We have logistic service providers for uh, uh, some truck companies. They have their own locations here. Uh, they uh, sometimes have their own cross dock centers, or they're working together with uh, trade or service providers. Uh, packaging uh, in square meters, you see, it's an important thing. We have Europol systems with their um, plastic cradles. They also cleaned here via the washing lines. So when they go back in the circulation, but we also have two big uh, uh, companies that are uh, making um, carton boxes. Uh, that's uh, it's kind of a, a racking tray system. Uh, so they are making uh, uh, cartons for the growers in the region, but also for uh, companies here, uh, other food companies in the region. Furthermore, we have some things around plants, uh, uh, pre-packing, separate pre-packing businesses growing. We have some processing around juices and stuff like that, cheese. Uh, and also we have, of course, uh, services, as I was talking about, the, the, the maintenance, the cleaning, and, the, and like the kindergarten. So here you see the, uh, all the companies uh, that are in the park. Uh, uh, we have about uh, 70, 75 tenants, but also they are allowed, uh, uh, after our permission, to have sub-tenants. Uh, and then we have more, I guess, more than 100 companies on the, on the park. The buildings, uh, we have all type of buildings you can imagine, uh, brand new ones, but also all the buildings, even the, more than uh, 50 years, 60 years old. But we have uh, basically three types. We have the multi-tenant unit buildings. So here, this building are units of 700 square meters. There's a small office, you have three docks, and they even can be cooled up to two and four degrees. So you get a key and you can do business. Also bigger units of 2,500 square meters. Uh, a, a lot of single tenant buildings for processor, for the cash and carry uh, for the big service providers have 15, 16,000 square meters. Uh, uh, even we have our own service provider here has 30,000 square meters. And on the right side, we have some multi tenant examples uh, that are sometimes all the buildings uh, uh, we use. We split them up uh, uh, as long as quality of the building so permits to do so. And you can some, do some um, 
uh, storage type uh, things and transport uh, activities. But also, and that's very interesting, interesting in the agreements we make, we can we help the, the, the our clients grow. Uh, they have a facility, like the upper one, like Stai Food Group. Uh, they go from 4,000, 7,000 to 15,000 meters in uh, less than 15 years. And that's all possible within the agreements we make. We, we look and have other tenants for the buildings that are left behind. Or another uh, type is uh, for like Frank de Koning, also a, a huge building. We build a new one that's not much bigger than square meters, but it's instead of six meters high, it's 12 meters high. So uh, um, he can solve the seasonal peaks with wrecking and these kind of solutions. So that's the way of a smart thinking. But don't forget the new kids on the block, the startups, the scale ups, uh, playing around with juices, uh, getting ingredients out of tomatoes and uh, uh, cucumbers, or like recycled, uh, 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 making cool packs for the e commerce food world, or like Celta is doing, and playing around making nice product of mushrooms. Here we say the new way in which we are building. Actually, we are building this at the moment. Uh, these are uh, uh, warehouses. Uh, we we uh, um, are unit building. Uh, we build them within 10 months, 12 meters high, and uh, with uh, a lot of possibilities. And with the units, you create uh, flexibility. It's, it's really important how to get flexibility in real estate. Things are changing also in the food chain. Uh, I, of course, everyone, we, and also we are also looking what does it mean for us? Where are the consumers? Where's the production? Uh, 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 what kind, what are the logistic models going to be? Where are the potential clusters? So you do that with universities like uh, Wageningen. Uh, uh, we look uh, at uh, uh, for what do we have to do with processing building because people want more convenience. What does it mean for us in building? Uh, we are luckily, we are a vegetable hub. Uh, Vegan is going really quickly. Uh, so more people want more healthy products, more vegan products. So uh, what does it mean for our cluster? Uh, the whole thing around uh, um, uh, waste. Here we have a lot of waste in the beginning of the uh, of, of of the supply chain on the production side, and you have waste uh, at our at our homes. Uh, what can we do with waste? For instance, we are looking with uh, scale ups. Uh, can we dry dry products that cannot go to the fresh markets, so we can use them later? as uh, ingredients for companies. And the other thing uh, we also know, all know uh, e-commerce is really going. Uh, the Corona even has enhanced that a lot. And the whole thing, e-commerce, data orchestrating, all these things, they go hand in hand and make that uh, you can do other things in fresh and distribution supply chains. So in summary, uh, um, essential thing we are doing on the park or a hub, uh, as, uh, whatever you call it, it's a kind of an orchestrating uh, role. Uh, so that means you really faci facilitate companies uh, in the food supply chain, having to do with uh, real estate ready to use flexibility. How can you add services for tenants and park users? Maybe you can work with reallocation. So you look at companies that might fit in your uh, park, but you have to get from other locations in the region or in the country. Uh, how can you facilitate the startups and the scale ups? Uh, we use a lot of energy because all of the buildings, 60, 70 percent, is really uh, uh, conditioned. So we use a lot of energy. So how can we do that as, as efficient as possible with solar and wind energy? But also the food supply chain, uh, the regional production. Uh, I'm talking about all this is important, uh, but it's also important that we keep it like this in this region, uh, together with the multimodal connections which you need to get in all the products that are not grown here uh, uh, at the moment, like avocados, uh, the big melons, uh, and the bananas. Further, we focus more on the processing and pre-packing of, uh, of food. Uh, we as facilitators, how can we facilitate those companies that are doing that? And the same as uh, with our buildings, also in the transport, how can we uh, facilitate sustainable transport? Transport, for instance, that transport companies can get uh, uh, hydrogen uh, uh, from our uh, uh, gas stations here on the park. But we have to build, uh, you have to, uh, you should building be able to be uh, build relationships. It's all about people and entrepreneurs. And our networks uh, really have to do with uh, municipalities, government organizations, but also logistic and uh, real estate clubs and uh, platforms. Uh, because you find new things, you work with them together, they help you with difficult, complex problems. 
uh, you look at research things with universities or other schools, uh, but also with it, you need the students as they can be your new um, employees. So uh, thank you for your attention. I hope uh, you get some new insights by this. Uh, and again, uh, as Dutch Argo Food Hubs, we have uh, a lot to offer, let's say, fast and sustainable lanes for food into Europe. Thank you. 目前以冷库容量为依据，成立于二零一三年的 Agro Merchants 集团，排名全球第四。其设施网络遍布美国、澳大利亚、荷兰、西班牙、英国、葡萄牙等国。在专业领域，公司不仅精于冷链物流仓储，更是注重通过增值服务来提高客户服务水平。卡洛斯是集团创始人之一，现任 CEO， 在供应链领域拥有超过二十四年的领导经验。他将为观众分享其运营管理经验以及对于行业背后更多的思考。Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure for me to participate in the Global Cone Chain Summit 2020. My name is Carlos Rodriguez, and I am the CEO of Agro Merchants Group, and also one of the founders. And I would like to talk to you today about how to set up a cold chain in Europe. And in order to do that, I will also Talk to you a bit about our company and who we are, because basically what we have been doing over the last seven years since we started this company is setting up cold chains between different countries all over the world. So, I will start with、uh, some of the highlights of our vision and our mission. So, basically, we want to be the leading partner of temperature control logistics, supporting the global supply, food supply chain. And we are very much focused on commodity expertise because it is one of our key focus. I will touch on that a bit later. And also, we are、uh, basically the legacy of a number of very specialized family companies that had a, you know, obviously an entrepreneurial spirit. And we really want to maintain that, and it's a key focus and part of our day-to-day -day business. In relation to our mission, basically, it's very simple. We want we handle fresh and frozen food on behalf of our customers, and we are really the the point of entry or exit for most of those volumes when they go out of certain you know countries or farming areas, and also are received in the destination point. Taking customer care is of course an absolute、uh, principle or a component or element of our mission, and is one of our key focus. So. Having said that, I will explain、uh, what is our role in the food supply chain. So basically, agro merchants mainly have a large cold storage facilities. Cold storage is only one of our、uh, one of the, of the services that we provide. But in addition to that, we provide a significant number of services and value-added services within those warehouses. Also, packaging, freezing, X-ray. Etc. I will touch on that、uh, in a later slide. So that is one of our key focus. You know, at the point of、uh, exit or export, or at the point of entry, or within a country, we are a key component of the supply chain. In the case of national distribution,、um, you know, basically that is that is really you know what our main core competency. In addition to that, we also handle transportation. In many cases, between the ports and the warehouses. In other cases, we handle outbound distribution. All again focus on the temperature control food industry, and in certain countries, we even have our own fleet and provide full transport solutions depending on the characteristics of the country and the customer and the basically the supply chain in that specific part of the world. We, as I said, agro merchants started two thousand in two thousand and thirteen. With one main objective that was to have a international footprint, in order to support our customers on a global basis. Over the last seven years, through acquisitions, greenfields,、um, and also expansions, we have now you know 66 temperature control facilities in 11 countries, in the four you know four continents, and we have a very strong presence,、uh, obviously, in the U.S. And、as you can see here, we have we are mainly focused on the northeast coast of the U.S., southeast and west, and we are the largest receiver of 
beef products into the United States. We are also the largest receiver of uh, fresh produce on the East Coast. In the West Coast, we are mainly focusing meat also on fresh produce. And in the Southeast Coast of the US, we have different type of, of commodities and businesses mainly, mainly focused on packaged foods in the Georgia region, but also in places like Savannah or Charleston, we are a key entry point in the country, an exit point in the country of, of temperature control food products. In the case of Europe, and we are talking also, part of my presentation is about how to set up a cold chain in the Netherlands. So obviously, because the importance of the port of Rotterdam, we have a very strong presence in the Netherlands. Uh, we have several facilities around the, in Rotterdam and around the Rotterdam area, like in the case of Kirk, that I will touch on later, or Barnevel, uh, Masflakte, and in the Westland, that is an area focused on fresh produce near the port of Rotterdam. As you can see, we have also uh, have been growing significantly in the Iberian region, uh, Spain and Portugal, also very strong presence in the UK and Ireland, uh, Austria, in Poland, obviously the, the port of Gdansk continues to grow and Gdynia, and we are very much focused there. And yeah, as I said, we continue as part of our journey to grow and to try to be present in locations where we can support international um, supply chains and a variety of customers that, that, you know, that are expanding also in multiple countries. In the case of Latin America and Asia Pacific, as you can see here, we are very much focused on, on Chile, uh, where we, we have the largest coal store facility in, in, in the country, based in Santiago. We also have a strong presence through a um, joint venture with a company called Confrio in Brazil, with a number of facilities all over the country. And in the case of Australia, we have one main uh, location in the Brisbane, and that location with two large coal stores is very much focused on the export of meat products from Australia to China, US, and other countries. In relation to service offering, as I was saying before, we, we specialize very much in commodity expertise, uh, meat, fresh produce, seafood, dairy, et cetera, and others, but not only understanding you know, and, and having a lot of experience with those commodities and how we handle them. But we very much want to be an extension of our customers and, and an integral part of the supply chain. As a result of that, we are very much focused on value added services. Those include, depending on the commodity, some of them are cross commodity, as you can see here. Other ones are very much services that specialize on the fresh fruit and fresh produce and vegetable segment of our business. Same thing happens in the frozen side or in the meat side. We have some services that are unique to the poultry industry or the beef industry or the seafood industry. And obviously I will not go through all of them here, but some of them are very innovative, like the X-ray that we provide to determine the level of fat content in beef. And based on that, we segregate and pack products in different ways for you know, the grading and the final production uh, uh, for our customers. We also have a, an optical grader in Bailan. We also have acoustic ways to determine the level of maturity of avocados. And blast freezing, of course, is a key core competency. And we have a large variety, as you can see there, and others that are not mentioned of services that are absolutely critical to su support the, the, the supply chain and you know especially from a temperature control point of view i think um, you know that was a general quick overview and understanding of, of who we are and what we are doing and the team asked me to focus also and, and include uh, two case studies so of, of product flows between china and the netherlands and this is the first one as you can see, you know, we, we import large quantities for our customers on behalf of our customers of Chinese ginger into the Netherlands. And in order to do that, so there are a number of, of steps or principles that basically, you know, traders or producers are following uh, with our support. The first one will be to set up a European company if needed, if they don't have one already established. Uh, second thing that we do is, of course, 
you know, take care of the containers when they arrive to, to the port of Rotterdam on behalf of our customers. We also support the organization of, with a freight forwarding business unit that we have. We organize any charges, documentation, et cetera, that are required when the container arrives to, to the port. We also handle directly or sometimes uh, using third parties the movement of the or haulage of the container uh, from, from the port to our dedicated warehouses. We have, in this case, two in the Rotterdam area for fresh produce. And I will explain in a second, uh, we have, you know, the ginger specifically is receiving both of them, but we have picked our Rotterdam, we call it Rotterdam location that is just in the port and is able to receive traditional also contain um, reefer vessels. We, of course, discharge the pallets, check the quality, labeling, etc. We have physiosanitary physio inspections uh, in place at the facility. We deal with customs clearance. We, of, of course, store the product at the right temperature. We have a large you know, number of chambers uh, that are you know, customized from a temperature point of view to our customer needs. In some cases, if the dragging of the ginger is required, our team will ha handle that. And of course, we sort, repack, label, and prepare everything for the destination on behalf of our customers. And the destination could be, you know, um, many different points. Of course, very much focus, uh, and one of the largest is the retail industry. And we, you know, supply to companies like Aldi, Coop, and many others from this location in Rotterdam. Uh, this uh, specific uh, case study or example, uh, you know, is, is handled, as I said, in one of our facilities. We call it AgroMerchants Rotterdam, because as you can see there in the map, is in the old, you know, part of the port of Rotterdam, in the heart uh, of the port. And, you know, this facility has 19,000 square meters of space, truly specialized in international flows of every type of fresh produce product. And sometimes we handle also other commodities, but mainly fresh produce that is coming from Asia, Africa, South America, as I said, all over the world. You can see there some of the value added services that we provide, packing uh, in different ways and forms, uh, labeling, quality control, quality inspections, and you know, obviously you know, almost anything that our customers require. Sometimes we can handle it directly. Otherwise, we will bring a third party within the facility for whatever reason. We need very, very specialized uh, support that we don't have had at that moment. And we have all the certifications that are required. You can see there to handle uh, ginger and many other products. And we are very proud to receive this, you know, this product, uh, you know, from the Chinese producers with the ultimate destination of the of the Dutch. Western and Northern European markets. The second case study that we have chosen is of a very different commodity, but a very similar, you know, from a supply chain point of view flow. And this is the case of Chinese tilapia that is receiving our ERC facility. Agromerchants ERC is truly fully specialized in the seafood industry. And I will touch in a second in the main characteristics of that location. But again, similar steps, you know, if the producer or exporter doesn't have, you know, a, a entry into Europe or in the Netherlands, the first thing is to set up a European company or find a partner or a trader that can help them with their, their you know, bringing the product into the country. Agromerchants, of course, will take care and work with you in relation to all the other necessary steps. Same, similar to what I said before, that includes collect the container, charges and fees and the terminal handling that includes bringing the container to our facility, dealing with all the documentation. We have as agromerchants another facility in the Masflakte area in Rotterdam, where we have a border inspection or control post. We will take care there of any veterinary inspections if are necessary and paperwork, et cetera. We will bring the containers to our ERG facility and there we will deal with all requirements from unloading, temperature checks, sometimes 
some level of repacking and no applying to this case, but we also do blast freezing in our ERG facility for local seafood producers. And, you know, in the case of the tilapia, once the product is stored and after it's moved to the shipping area for distribution, we support almost, you know, every single destination in Europe, north, south, east and west. And we work with our customers and different transport companies to ensure that the product goes to the ultimate destination. This is the facility that I was referring to in ERC. Uh, the facility have, has expanded twice in the last five years. We have approximately 40,000 pallets of capacity. And you can see there the value added services that we provide. You can also see there the different commodities and services. And again, you can also see there that we comply with all the certifications, quality accreditations, etc., that are, of course, very important and required uh, when you are handling food products. Um, I will move into the last slide of the presentation, but basically, um, you know, just wanted to provide some color to the audience about different trends that are happening and how we agro merchants see them in the temperature control to the industry. So, of course, flexibility, flexibility, flexibility. You know, customers want to have as much flexibility as possible, especially in these days where, you know, the, the COVID and situation is, is a perfect example when, you know, sometimes for, you know, different reasons, in this case, a health reason, you know, there are changes in, in different supply chains and levels of consumption and even in the channels in which the product is shipped. So flexibility is paramount if you want to, you know, be a true leader in temperature control logistics. And that is what we are trying to accommodate all the time for our customers. Same thing and related to flexibility will be the decision on product destination. Sometimes on increasing, and that is why I capture this as a trend, customers want to have optionality. And therefore, the labeling, the preparation, et cetera, of the product, sometimes you need to wait until the very last minute, you know, hours. And, and that is something that we, as a service provider, need to keep in mind all the time to allow our customers to make decisions depending on how the market is, is evolving and, and, and the different channels of distribution. Very important, one-stop shop for all solutions. You know, we, as a company, are copying and pasting from one location to the other different services. And we are trying to, in most locations, trying to, if you like, widen or offer a, a variety of services to allow our customers to rely on us and some other parties. But of course, that they don't have to go to five, six, seven companies for different things that they need. So we are really focusing on that to make sure that they have one place where they can uh, you know, that somebody can arrange them everything that they need. Value added services, I have explained already, we are doing more and more value added services, again, to reduce the number of steps in the supply chain and simplify things. But of course, that requires investment from our side on a variety of things, including infrastructure, equipment, et cetera. But we are very much uh, determined to, you know, to be the one-stop shop and investing in the business on an ongoing basis. Transparency, of course, you know, everyone uh, these days, the consumer, origin, destination, everyone wants to have traceability. Everyone wants to know where the product is, what the status is, et cetera. So a clear trend that continues to evolve is full visibility, traceability, and transparency of the products. And finally, quality of course, is very important, not only our customers, but also their customers and the end consumer and the retailer. Everyone wants to have class one product. So quality is very important. And uh, yeah, and we are all, you know, as a service provider, very much a part of the supply chain and helping our customers to ensure that, um, yeah, that quality is, is paramount within everything that happens with the products and in the food supply chain. That is all that I have prepared for this purpose. Uh, again, very uh, appreciative and glad to participate in the Global Cold Chain Summit. 
and appreciate and thank you for your attention. Thanks. 作为全球洋葱贸易的主要参与者，荷兰每年向全球一百四十个国家出口超过十二亿公斤洋葱，占全球市场份额百分之十五。Visca 是创始于一九三三年的家族企业，已经成为全球最大的洋葱包装商和出口商，位于荷兰南部，处于三个港口之间，服务于全球一百二十五个市场。那么，今天公司第四代掌门人将从贸易商角度来分析冷链究竟可以如何确保食品安全与品质，以及向我们介绍荷兰洋葱产业链的现状。Good day. Good afternoon. Good day. My name is Shoyan Viskerke. I am responsible for my family business, Viskerke Onions. We are today the largest packer and exporter of Dutch consumption onions. And we are located in the Netherlands, the south of the Netherlands. I have been asked to share a little bit about uh, the Netherlands and the onion industry and uh, the logistics part. Because today the Netherlands is the largest exporter of onions globally. We only carry 2% of the world production. Major onion producing countries are United States, India and China. However, the Netherlands by volume carries more than 15% of the world market share and therefore makes it today by volume the largest exporting country of onions in the world. This is due to several factors. Uh, first of all, in the Netherlands, we have ideal climate to grow onions. We are relatively located north from the equator, therefore having uh, long days. It allows us to cultivate onion varieties which are year-round storageable. The onions which we grow here are relatively small in size profile, are uh, very strong, and therefore we can harvest um, mechanically. Uh, we can also pack our onions uh, completely uh, automated and uh, the quality of the onions remain as strong, that it allows us to export our onions uh, all over the world. We can easily have our onions uh, packed in refrigerated containers, 40 foot reefers, for uh, 30 to 50 days without having any concessions on quality when healthy product is packed. Secondly, here in the Netherlands, we are uh, very well equipped, uh, first of all by knowledge, but of course also by machinery and infrastructure to produce onions. There are 3,000 growers all over the Netherlands uh, who are producing approximately 26,000 hectares of onions annually. And with one harvest, a year, we produce around 1.5 billion kilos of onions, of which 90% is destined for exports. Only 10% remains domestically for consumption. When you look at the three number, uh, the three largest uh, growers of onions in the world, they produce a large number of onions. However, their consumption pattern is over 90%, which remains domestic. So only 10% is export driven. Next to ideal climate of growing onions, the second strong part of the Netherlands uh, being able to grow onions is the knowledge, not only about seeds, but also on production, on packing and storage. But thirdly, one of our most important competitive advantages today is our uh, logistical position. We are uh, a relatively small country and it allows us to have a relatively small distance from grower to pack house and port. First of all, uh, before I talk a little bit further about that, I have presented here an image of the global trade pattern of onions. And you can see that the Netherlands today is one of the epicentrum exporting countries in the world. The Netherlands exports year round and to more than 140 countries. We export not only to cover shortages in local crops, but also to fulfill gaps which become available after a natural disaster or uh, a shortage. Because our, because our country is, um, like I said, relatively small, um, we have easily access to the port. So wherever in the country, within two hours, two and a half hours of drive, you can reach the major port of Rotterdam. And from Rotterdam, we can reach almost any major port destination in the world within 30 days. The connectivity, therefore, is optimal. Um, 
Rotterdam has a relatively high inflow of reefers, therefore we have good equipment or good availability of equipment uh, continuously to have our exports done. Also onions are exported to conventional, but this is a relatively small volume. Uh, this is mainly done to West Africa, uh, but to maintain the highest quality uh, of onions, we use mainly refrigerated containers. In these refrigerated 40-foot reefers, we can load uh, around 28 tons uh, of onions. And the, technic, uh, the technical advantage uh, we have today is that we have the ability to not only track and trace the exact location of the container itself, but we can also watch live the temperature and the humidity within a container. We therefore have such access to information that is almost like transporting by truck. And we can really control the quality. Even it allows us to, to control uh, so closely that we can guarantee quality upon arrival when containers are being shipped or on the water for uh, 40 or 50 days. Settings depend, of course, on the destination. And uh, uh, it depends uh, also on the, the requirements of the customer. Not only uh, the advantage of logistics has made that the Netherlands has really grown to become the major player in the export uh, of onions, but it all starts with the production. The growers in the Netherlands are so specialized in uh, the crop uh, of onions. Of course, other agricultural uh, products are being grown here successfully. However, onions are an important part of the crop rotation of the grower. It is a product which is uh, free traded uh, on the market daily traded on the market and um, the, the also the, the quality standards here in the Netherlands are very high. Uh, we guarantee food safety by controlling uh, the onions uh, by independent laboratory to test for food safety, but also the specific country requirements uh, of some of our destinations are so extremely high that uh, soils are being checked before seedings and also the crop is being tested uh, several times during the growing phase. The regulations on the growing part are becoming very strict. We are following European regulations and we see that there is more and more um, a non-allowance of uh, different herbicides and pesticides, making it for the growers um, a challenge to grow under these very strict and high quality standard conditions. After these 3,000 growers in the Netherlands, which are highly skilled and uh, professional in, in growing onions, there are approximately 40 companies who are grading and packing. It allows here in the Netherlands to have a weekly capacity of approximately 35,000 tons. These onions are being shipped to 140 countries and we have the ability to do so year round. The quality of the product, but also the knowledge in the industry from starch, but also packing, allows us to store our onions from one crop year round. We are currently starting our new export season. Uh, we are July uh, 2020 and uh, the crop is looking uh, relatively good for, uh, for exports to start again. Annually, the Netherlands have been growing continuously um, by exports of course, it depends on uh, the quantity available here in the Netherlands, but it, are, it is mostly important of how the crop uh, result comes in the United States, China and India. If there are several shortages globally, the Netherlands has very high capacity uh, to deliver at a very short uh, period in time and at relatively sharp cost prices. Um, but most important, it is the quality which uh, allows us to reach almost uh, every destination uh, in the world. I would like to show you a little bit more on how it is possible that the Netherlands has become so successful in the exports of onions globally and that our volume is growing still on a yearly basis. Well, this has everything to do with the very uh, high quality in value chain. We are a relatively small country, therefore the distance from, pack, from grower to pack house to port is relatively small, but it's also split. Our value chain knows growers which are separately, which are highly professional and skilled at growing onions and storing onions. After that, we have pack houses, which are equipped with the newest technology, with uh, camera systems to check on internal and external quality, with the highest capacity of packing machines and creating therefore 
uh, a good uh, availability of, uh, of onions to export uh, on, uh, on a daily basis. The connectivity from our ports, not only from our pack house to the ports, but also from the ports um, out, uh, allows us really to have our onions exported uh, at any time whenever there is a shortage or a need for importation. I hope I have given you a little bit of insight in the onion industry of the Netherlands. In short, a recap. Uh, the Netherlands today is the number one in exports globally. We export annually over 1.2 billion kilos of onions to more than 140 countries. This has uh, been growing over the last years, and that has everything to do with uh, high quality standards, high quality product, but also knowledge in the industry to produce um, a type of product which is um, year-round uh, available at uh, the demand of the specific customers and countries in the world. Our access to ports, not only in Rotterdam, but also Antwerp, Belgium, and the new development of inland ports allows us to have access within almost two hours of driving. But most important, the connectivity from our main port, Rotterdam and Antwerp, allows us to reach any port in the world uh, within uh, closely 30 days. With uh, refrigerated 40-foot reefers, we export our onions. Depending on the destination and the requirements of the clients, we have different set points. And the technology today allows us to carefully uh, monitor the, the, the location of the container itself, but it also allows us to watch live the temperature and humidity within the container. The moment we see there is a change in temperature or there's a change in humidity, I have the ability also to receive a notification of which customers can be informed. It allows really us to carefully guarantee the quality upon arrival. So the customer can be ensured that the product is arriving in good condition at the right time as uh, requested. Thank you for uh, your attention and interest and um, wish you to receive more information. You may always contact us. Thank you. 荷兰的食品谷位于瓦和宁根中心拥有完善的科研体系Leo Lucas, we'd like to share the innovation and technologies of Fresh Cold Chain. It's our honor to join this event with you. Globally, one third of food are wasted. It is really a pity because food could, this food could contribute to feeding two billion people. Meanwhile, global sourcing year-round supply, high quality and food safety brings continuous challenge and demand in the supply chain. China accounts Number one in vegetable and fruit waste and losses. Optimized cold chain could contribute a lot, both domestically and internationally. It's not only outstanding in agricultural production, but also processing supply chain and agrologistic. All this contributes to the second position of Netherlands in agri-food exporting globally, especially agrologistic, increased much faster than production same trend may happen in China. There could be a lot of potential to collaborate between China and the Netherlands in this field. Sponsored by RVO and the Dutch Embassy in China, our team in VER is conducting a research that aims to explore the collaboration further in this domain between two countries. We have interviewed over 20 industry leaders and exports from China and over 10 from the Netherlands. Thanks for all the contributions. The re research results will be presented in September during the China Business Week event by RVO. Welcome you to join. Wahling University and Research is number one in agri-food domain. We based in the Netherlands but contribute to the global challenges. Called the newly 
position that link fundamental research and industry application with partners all over the world. Then in the fresh cold chain domain, fresh food uh, challenge as they are perishable living products. The quality will be highly affected by supply chain conditions, especially temperature or cold chain. Food can, uh, chain conditions management can help to reduce the mechanistic damage, physiology deterioration, pathologic deterioration of fresh products. To optimize post-harvest quality of fresh products, multidiscipline approach is needed. In Ver, we have the team with experts from post-harvest physiology, post-harvest engineer, agrologistic, and the big data. All these are crucial for cold chain optimization. Take the uh, Green Challenge project as the example. We worked with uh, 29 partners in 12 countries with the aim to build model to predict the quality of fresh products in time by measuring initial products, monitoring the chain conditions, and understand the product development. Interesting and valuable results are found and also applied. Part of the results are available to public. Here at last, I show the top 10 post-harvest loss reasons in fruit and vegetable supply chain. Cold chain by far the most crucial ones. We have many successful cases in this domain to solve industry challenges. For example, the Quest 2 project with mask led by Dr. Lucas developed an intelligent control system of river container, helped the mask reduce 65% of energy use. Leo will introduce further of the technology related to river container. Now let's give the floor to our colleague, Dr. Lucas. Floor is yours. Thank you very much for your kind introductions and hello everyone. Today, our presentation will be on humidity control and fresh air exchange in reefers, with a special focus on lowest feasible relative humidity, temperature, and energy consumption. I will be reporting on work done by myself, together with my colleague Gerhard Leemsvaar. The outline of my presentation. We will first have a look at the background and the aim of the presentation, materials and methods, then we will show the results, discussion, and conclusion. Today, the world counts over a million reefer containers. Reefer containers are crucial in the global trade of temperature-sensitive goods. Nearly every reefer has three setting options. First, the temperature set point, then the relative humidity set point, and fresh air exchange. The standard settings are a temperature set point which is optimal for the carried good, relative humidity set point off, and fresh air exchange closed. The title of my presentation is Humidity and Fresh Air Exchange in Reefers. Let's analyze all three keywords a bit closer. In the shipping industry, the term humidity control is commonly used, but it is a bit misleading, as it may suggest the possibility to actively control the moisture content of the air. That is not the case. In reefers, we can only dehumidify, so there is no option to supply moisture to the container. The second keyword of our title is fresh air exchange. Fresh air exchange means the intake of warm, humid air. This moisture will have to condense somewhere inside the container. In principle, that is not an immediate problem. Of course, it is better to avoid the risk if it's not necessary. Therefore, the base rule is fresh air exchange should be closed. Our third keyword is reefers. Let's have a look at the main outline of reefers as far as relevant to dehumidification and fresh air exchange. Reefer units have two evaporator fans. The evaporator fans keep the air circulation going. Return air is drawn from the cargo space through the return air grid into the refrigeration unit. And at the bottom, as supply air, it enters the container again in the T-bar floor. On its way through the refrigeration unit, somewhere off behind the return air grid, it hits the relative humidity sensor. That measured relative humidity is controlled to the relative humidity set point. The air goes further down, passes the evaporator where its temperature is reduced, then a heater where the air is reheated, and then a supply air temperature sensor. This measured supply air temperature is regulated to the set point. The trick of dehumidification is that the heater is on. 
And because the heater is on, the evaporator needs to be cooled to a lower temperature, causing an extra amount of condensation. That condense is drained off through drain gutters, a drain pan and a drain line to outside the container. Fresh air exchange. Every refrigeration unit has the possibility for fresh air exchange. There is a fresh air inlet and a fresh air outlet. And in all units, the pressure drop over the evaporator fan is the driving force for fresh air exchange. And always the fresh air inlet is above the evaporator coil. So in principle, the moisture entering this fresh air first hits the evaporator where it is condensed, and then, only then, it enters the cargo space. As mentioned, the default situation is humidity control off and fresh air exchange closed. However, sometimes humidity control is activated and fresh air exchange is opened. And then there is no data available on the adverse effects of humidity control and fresh air exchange. Therefore, the aim of this study is to measure the effect of dehumidification and fresh air exchange on three parameters. One, the relative humidity inside the container. Two, the power uptake. And three, the supply air temperature. Well, let's have a look at how we did that and go to materials and methods. In this study, we did a series of climate chamber tests. Two representative reefer units were subjected to the tests. The two were of different brands and different types, but both of them were young. One was one year old, the other was two years old when it was tested. Power supply during all tests was 60 Hz and 460 volts, which is the standard on container vessels. Tests were done on empty containers, so there was no influence of a humidifier or a heater or a cargo during the tests, just empty containers. The conditions in the chamber during the test at the fresh air exchange inlet were 33 degrees C and a relative humidity of 75%. Here are some photos illustrating the measurement equipment we used. In the return aggregate, we measured relative humidity and temperature, and we used two sensors for that to work in duplicate. Also at the fresh air inlet, so this is the fresh air exchange of a reefer container. Near the fresh air exchange, we had two sensors for temperature and relative humidity. One we see, the other is right behind it. And we measured the power uptake of the unit with one of our calibrated power meters. To measure the effect on supply air temperature, we recorded the supply air temperature in every other T-bar opening. In the photo on the left, you see the T-bar floor of the container. In the photo on the right, you see that we covered the first one and a half meter of the T-bar floor and we inserted a sensor in every next uh, T-bar opening. We tested in 10 different conditions. As a reference, we measured at 20 degrees C with humidity set point off and fresh air exchange closed, 20 degrees C is kind of representative for tulip bulbs. The other reference is at minus 3.5 degrees C, also humidity set point off, fresh air exchange closed. The minus 3.5 is a typical temperature for garlic shipments. Then, to assess the independent effects of fresh air exchange and relative humidity control, we first did a test where relative humidity stayed off but the fresh air exchange is maximally open at 250 cubic meters per hour. Then we did a test where dehumidification was activated by entering a relative humidity set point of 60% and the fresh air exchange is closed. At minus 3.5, we added the same two tests. Finally, we wanted to assess the effect of fresh air exchange in combination with dehumidification. So the humidity set point stayed at 60% and fresh air exchange was opened. First, 225 then to the maximum 250 cubic meters per hour. And again, the same was done at minus 3.5 degrees C. When is a test completed? We decided to terminate the test after four hours steady state or when two defrosts had occurred. Let's go and have a look at the test results. Let's have a look at the average relative humidity as a function of set point, relative humidity set point and fresh air exchange. First, the reference conditions. For both units, the temperature control without dehumidification and with closed fans yields a relative humidity around 95%. A 
except for unit X at minus 3.5 degrees C. There, the relative humidity is around 80%. Secondly, opening the fresh air exchange. We tested it on only one of the units. Not much effect of maximally opening the fresh air exchange. Relative humidity stays around 95%. Thirdly, activating dehumidification. There is a big effect in unit X. Relative humidity reduced till below 60%. But unit Y does not manage to reduce relative humidity below 75%, not even when the vents are closed. Fourthly, opening the fresh air exchange while dehumidifying. In unit X, the lowest feasible relative humidity increases when the fresh air exchange increases, especially at a colder set point of minus 3.5 degrees C. The lowest feasible relative humidity in unit Y appears largely insensitive to the fresh air exchange. Finally, looking at all data together, we more or less observe the following general principles. When the set relative humidity is off and the vent is closed, the relative humidity is around 95% regardless of temperature. Opening the vent while the set relative humidity is off hardly affects relative humidity. Setting relative humidity to 60% reduces relative humidity, but the set value of 60% is mostly not reached. Reducing the vent opening while the set relative humidity is 60% reduces the relative humidity, but that effect is very limited in unit Y. Let's have a look on the effect on power uptake. First, the reference condition. For both units, just temperature control without dehumidification and with closed vents demands approximately 2 kilowatt. Secondly, Opening the fresh air exchange maximally. At 20 degrees C, the power uptake doubles, but at minus 3.5, the effect is much worse, nearly 8 kilowatt. These differences are all explained by the enthalpic content of the incoming air. Thirdly, activating dehumidification. There is a big effect on both units, a rise from about 2 to 8 kilowatt. Fourthly, opening the fresh air exchange while dehumidifying. The power uptake increases when fresh air exchange increases, but the effect is limited. Finally, looking at all data together, we more or less observe the following general principles. When the humidity control is off and the vent closed, the power uptake is 2 kW. Opening the vent while humidity control is off has a strong effect when the ambient air is distinctly warmer and more humid than inside. Setting relative humidity to 60% increases the power uptake from 2 to 8 kW. Reducing the vent opening while the relative humidity set point is 60% reduces power uptake at most 1.3 kW, a limited effect compared to the effect of dehumidification. Let's see how supply air temperature distribution across the width of the container response to temperature set point, relative humidity set point, and fresh air exchange. So here we have the measurement set up. Left to right, a lot of temperature measurements. Left is a graph of the temperatures measured from left to right in unit X in five different test conditions. At the right, we have the same graph, but for unit Y. Generally speaking, we can see that the coldest measurement is around 19 degrees C, the warmest is around 21 degrees C. Altogether, this is not so bad. Here we see the same graphs for minus 3.5 degrees C. At minus 3.5 degrees C, the time averaged supply air temperatures range between minus 5 over here and plus 1 over there. This is actually too much. The harm is especially done by fresh air exchange and not by dehumidification. And we can see that because the gray line and the dark blue line are quite on top of each other. And the only difference is dehumidification while the fresh air exchange is closed. The same for unit Y. Only when we open the fresh air exchange, for example, the light blue one, well, then we really get deviations. Shippers should be aware of these effects. And these big temperature differences 
must be caused by an uneven distribution of frost formation on the evaporator coil, where the frost is the effect of moisture coming into the container with the fresh air exchange. Well, and here it is time for a discussion of our test results. A few comments. First of all, we should be aware these tests were done in an ambient condition of 33 degrees C and 75% relative humidity. This is really warm and extremely humid. Most of the time, reefers operate in milder conditions. Also, the fresh air exchange rates during our tests were up to 250 cubic meter per hour, while actually more than 25 cubic meter per hour is usually not needed in the field. We should also be aware that the vast majority of products does not need dehumidification. And this is a point of attention. I'm convinced there are way too many shipments where dehumidification is activated, while it's actually not necessary. And that may relate to a misunderstanding which I come across quite often. It is natural that relative humidity in reefer transport is about 90 to 95 percent. So if that is what you want, you do not need to specify a relative humidity set point. There is no point in specifying a relative humidity set point higher than 85 percent. Well, this leads to the following conclusions. To save energy, reduce the use of dehumidification and fresh air exchange in cases where the ambient is really warmer than the set point also in this order of priority. We should be aware that a relative humidity of 60% is mostly infeasible. For one of the two tested refrigeration units, the effect of fresh air exchange on relative humidity is negligible. And if it is really needed to use fresh air exchange while frost may form on the evaporator, that means while a set point of about plus 5 degrees C or colder is used, well, then be very much aware of the effect on supply air temperature. Well, and this brings us to the end of this presentation. Thank you all very much for your interest. Thank MERSC for financially supporting this project and for allowing us to present the results. I hope the insights I shared here will help you to optimize the way in, use, in where you use your reefer containers. Um, my name is Leo Lucasse. My contact details are on the screen. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. And in the meantime, bye for now. So the first question is for Annie. You are from the port, so we would like to hear from your opinions. Yes, of course, as a, as a port, we have had a significant impact by the uh, COVID-19 virus. Um, however, from the, the start, uh, our port has remained fully operational um, and uh, only the volumes have been impacted. What we see is that uh, the reefer business has been very differently impacted than any other business, as, uh, such as coals and um, uh, steel products. Um, the container business and especially the reefer business has a, seen a slight uh, decline where the reefers um, the import has even grown, uh, mostly from countries as uh, in, in Latin America and, and South Africa. Um, and what we have also seen is that um, uh, there has been a, a rise of the, um, uh, possibly uh, only temporarily, but a rise of the more conventional vessels. Um, for instance, for the, the, uh, the, the citrus from South Africa. This was due because the reefer equipment was um, under uh, pressure and the equipment was not available everywhere. So the conventional vessels um, were used to transport the goods on time. Also the port businesses, uh, and I'm sure some of the other participants can explain this further, uh, have always been fully operational. And of course, according to the uh, uh, all the regulations, um, have been able to uh, serve the customers as much as possible. Okay, I, I can react from uh, Fresh Park uh, with, about, with about 100 businesses on the park. Uh, what we could see that uh, companies that had to do a lot with the food service in Germany or the rest of Europe, they got a big uh, problem with the turnover. But on the other hand, the companies working with the retail they got really a boost in the first three, four months. 
So that uh, was leveling a little bit uh, out. Uh, and the other thing on the park itself, uh, with the measurements and the regulations we had here in Holland, they had to take care uh, around their workers because in, yeah, some packing station, 200, 250 people are working. So we have to take care that you have the right, right measurements to prevent COVID from uh, spreading. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we give the question to the Agaban. We know that uh, logistics has important uh, role for the food safety. So for just, uh, we would uh, like to uh, hear about, uh, hear from you about uh, the uh, impact of um, the pandemic on logistics companies and how to respond to them. I'm, yes, well, um, the uh, Holland International Distribution Council has about 300 members. Uh, half of those members are logistics companies. And uh, during the uh, initial phase of the COVID-19 uh, uh, outbreak, we contacted all our logistics companies, including uh, pharmaceutical logistics companies, food logistics companies, and just logistics companies doing general uh, cargo. And what we've seen is that um, they've all had to adapt uh, to doing business. Uh, like Jan has just explained, uh, people in the warehouse should not uh, work closely together to avoid spreading the disease, uh, which is even more important in the uh, food cold chain, uh, uh, because when you have a outbreak in the food chain, it's potentially quite a big uh, problem. What we've seen is that um, um, in general, there was plenty of food in the retail and all the supermarkets. So in the beginning, we saw a lot of people going to the supermarkets and buying a lot of, uh, um, uh, not fresh food, but food like rice and potatoes that you can uh, keep for a longer time because they were afraid that uh, the food levels will decline in the supermarkets, that there will be shortages. But what we actually saw is that there was no shortage in the, uh, in the supply chain uh, the stocks were all um, at a uh, normal level. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, maybe the tomatoes would run up and next day they were already uh, uh, replenished. So um, we saw quite a, um, an impressive show from the logistics, um, the food logistics in the Netherlands um, that was still operational and the replenishment was uh, very impressive. Uh, because I didn't have any shortages, I didn't see any shortages during the, uh, the pandemic. Um, and that's quite important because the Netherlands is a gateway to Europe. So uh, most of the food that enter Europe uh, is not destined for the uh, Dutch markets, it's actually destined for the European market. So um, a lot of our uh, logistics members um, are quite critical in the replenishment of German supermarkets and Belgium supermarkets and other supermarkets around Europe. Um, so our performance has made sure that the food supply chain in Europe uh, has remained intact. Um, so that is what I've seen and that what we have seen from HIDC as a uh, logistics association. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I turn to the original China. So Casper, uh, can you... Uh... Uh, can you share with us your insights? Uh, yes, so uh, for, for, for COVID-19, I, I, I think the, 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 what the general uh, question, what that is. Um, you, you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> I can continue if, um, for... Um, uh, our, our, our warehouses, especially in, uh, in the beginning, on the on, on the frozen side, uh, we've seen that a lot of the restaurants, uh, etc., have stopped accepting uh, um, any any products. So food service has has gone down. So uh, most of the the frozen warehouses that we 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 have um, had gone really high on in, in uh, stock levels. Uh, Especially a uh, frozen uh, fish and a frozen 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 meat that has to go to food service uh, as has stopped. Um, in uh, in in on the, on the fruit side, um, we've haven't seen a, a big 
um, effect other than um, the, the short term effect of uh, a lot more product being uh, sent to, to the supermarkets. Um, and, and, and now things are more or less uh, stabilizing again uh, and, and, and going up. So you have done a lot to ensure the food safety for the consumers during the COVID-19 pandemic because more uh, consumers would like to purchase foods at the, uh, at the supermarket instead of going out to have food outside. Thank you for your share. And uh, next, uh, so uh, Leo Lucas, Dr. Leo Lucas, so can you please share with us your insights and uh, during this really special uh, COVID-19 pandemic? Is the question, do you hear me? Yes, yes. I, I can hear you. Do I understand that the question is, hey, what is the impact of the corona pandemic on Wageningen University and research? Uh, no, uh, on the industry, on the agro, agro supply chain industry. So from what the effect has been? It, on the agro industry as a well. whole. Well, uh, I do not pretend that I am the one who oversees this business. But I can have a bit of an, well, I can share my thoughts on it. Uh, I think people need to eat. That's a given. So somehow the food supply industry will keep going. As simple as that. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, can, I can add a little bit about this. Yeah, about the research. Normally, uh, the Netherlands is famous for the e efficiency. For more, we are all try all our best to reach it, reach the highest uh, highest level of efficiency. But uh, the unexpected uh, unexpected uh, uh, COVID nineteen gave us uh, second thoughts that we need to think uh, also uh, resilience besides uh, efficiency, because. Uh, 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 this because sometimes the resilience is is not aligned with efficiency, but now we need to combine these two targets together. Yeah, sure. So it's okay. Maybe you can add because we have a big production region uh, around our hub. Uh, a lot of greenhouses they were afraid of labor. So what mm -hmm. happened that workers from the food service uh, uh, that also helped in greenhouses and the other fact and that also I think uh, uh, reaches to the research is that people say okay we really have to do more about uh, automatization and robotization also in the greenhouses mm -hmm. uh, to uh, be more sure in our processes if things like this happen and to prevent from diseases coming in. Yeah. So yeah, this is something happening also in somewhere else in the world. And so, um, uh, Riska, so is there any impact on your business during this pandemic? So, Riska, can, can you hear us? Yes. Sounded to me like this was a question for Wiskerke. Yes, but I heard. Yes. So is there is there uh, any impact on your business? You. So. Well, if you're asking impact on the business, yeah, some things. As said, we are renting warehouses to companies in the. In the in the in, in the in the in the food and uh, food and vegetable and food business and so there are some problems with companies that are really working with food service world about paying their rents of course that it, it it has effect on things in the business but on average as uh, Leo said everyone has to eat so we are in the good business. Same uh, same on our side we see that. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, the, the supermarket sales have jumped up by approximately 25%. Uh, overall exports uh, globally, we see that it has more uh, been stabilized. However, we see certain countries which are going back into second lockdown. 
or who are at least in the very problematic phase um, in the country itself, we see that the imports are slowing. Importers globally are uh, less willing to take risk of high volume. So we see the overall global trend being lower as what it has been before the pandemic. At the other side, in our industry, we are highly automized, and uh, this has made us very flexible to continue uh, to anticipate the higher uh, volumes which were required, especially in the first weeks of the pandemic. Being highly automized gives you the flexibility to scale up and also allows us to continue working with how, uh, without having the risk of a contamination. So uh, there's another one question for you, Chen is that uh, from our audience, in the map of earnings trade, some people found that there are few flows whose destinations are in China. So what's the reason behind it? So is, is a fact? Yes, this is a fact, right? Yes, this is correct. Currently, there is no uh, exports of Dutch onions specifically going to, to China. Uh, that is because today there is no phytosanitary agreement between, twine, uh, between China and the Netherlands. We have a phytosanitary agreement for fruits, uh, apple and pears are amongst them, and currently we are discussing the file of tomatoes. However, onions is uh, a promising product uh, to be exported from the Netherlands. Currently, the Netherlands is the largest exporting country in the world. We serve 140 countries and our quality standards are among the highest worldwide. Uh, we are used to also to uh, anticipate the import requirements, uh, whether it's done on soil testing or certain food safety standards, either at production sites or at the plant and export to companies. Um, therefore, we hope that uh, there is support uh, for the import of uh, onions perhaps shallots for China in the future, because we have seen that the moment there is a local shortage, there are import requirements. And today, China, uh, most of the crop they will produce will be consumed uh, domestically. Consumption patterns have been reducing, and when there are weather challenges, uh, there might be shortages in local crop availability, which the Netherlands could fulfill uh, seamlessly. Yeah, hope to. Hope so in the very near in the very near future we can we can buy onions from the Netherlands in China's supermarkets. Okay. Absolutely. So, yeah. Uh, I have uh, I give the first one question to everyone to share your insights uh, regarding the COVID nineteen pandemic. So the the second round I will give the uh, detailed questions to everyone. So first I would like to. Uh, Here's one question from our audience for Casper. The question is that what, what, what will be checked during the in and out of the warehouse to ensure the food quality from your business of operation level? Yeah, um, well, for us, it's uh, always uh, up to the customer uh, what uh, needs to be uh, checked, but it can be um, very broad. Uh, one of the things, of course, when we have products uh, like fruits coming from, uh, from, from China, it always needs veto inspection uh, by, by, the, by the Dutch uh, authorities. Other than that, what we check, um, that can be up to um, a full quality report with, um, you, for example, have um, uh, um, uh, pomelos um, they uh, open them up um, they, they they check um, they, they give photos they check how sour it is in, in inside uh, and give the yeah a full overview of how the, the, the palette looks like uh, what the temperatures um, um, are um, and yeah whatever that uh, the, 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 the customer customer um, would, would require um, and then yeah, they, they are inbounded. Yep. Thank you. So uh, one more question. So what, what's your opinion on the uh, uh, value-added services? So do you really uh, yeah. have some, uh, uh, or maybe you can share with us some examples about your um, value-added services in the cold storage? Yeah. Cold storage. Yep. 
Yes, um, a short. So um, where a couple of years ago, uh, simple cold storage or uh, Avic pallets come in uh, and out uh, in full without anything uh, done to the pallet was uh, was what was normal. What we see. Uh, more and more is that um, all pallets are coming in, something needs to be uh, done and something needs to be handled before they go uh, um, out again. Um, examples are, uh, for example, on the, on the, on the fruit side, uh, almost all pallets are or packed in um, uh, consumer-ready uh, packaging. Uh, they are um, all uh, checked on uh, quality before they go to the supermarkets. Uh, we send a lot to uh, German retail, uh, which have really high, high standards. Um, so uh, all packaging needs to be a, a, a need, um, or you need to be. It needs to be labeled. Uh, it uh, can be um, uh, box picked to uh, different uh, different re retailers. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a right uh, array of uh, possibilities um, uh, that that customers ca can need. Uh, that we perform for them. Yeah, thank you for your sharing. And I we got one question for Annie. So Annie, uh, there's a part of Russian plan on impl uh, implementing blockchain. Uh, blo blo uh, blockchain. What's your views on that? Blockchain. Yes, we are uh, looking at all uh, various digital solutions, uh, especially to increase the uh, transparency and efficiency in the chain. Um, uh, blockchain is one of the initiatives, um, and we have set up a operation together with uh, Korea Maersk and uh, Samsung, amongst others. Um, to develop this technology, um, where we especially want to test it on the fresh uh, supply chain, because we see that there is uh, added value to um, uh, in this supply chain for those kind of uh, solutions. Um, so that's definitely something that we are currently developing. Sure. sure. And uh, so is the uh, Rotterdam food food hub co uh, connected to the railway already now? Uh, the Rotterdam okay. Food Hub uh, is, is not connected to the railway at this moment. Uh, there is a railway connection uh, very close to the site, approximately one kilometer from the site. Um, mm -hmm. In future, we can see that this would be um, uh, a connected or a small uh, rail terminal could be invested there in order to connect the area with the rail service center, which is in the middle of the port and from which a lot of uh, rail connections go into the hinterland. Yeah, because, and also we know that the port of Rotterdam is really a uh, leading uh, company in this field. So what exactly the market share uh, do you occupy in the Northwest European market in terms of uh, reefers? In reefers, we are the, the biggest port uh, in, in yeah. Europe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, do you know the exact number, how much you occupy? Uh, no, I don't have the exact number no. at this moment. Um, okay. But by, by far, I know that. Uh, I think um, uh, the second largest reef port, uh, which is Antwerp, uh, okay. is about has a throughput of about uh, 11 or 12 million uh, tons, uh, where we in Rotterdam have um, over 16 million tons and growing each year. Wow, cool. So, and uh, another question for you is uh, that, uh, what's your opinion on multimodal, multimodal transportation? So, because yes. uh, what's, the, uh, what's the competitive advantage for you and of, you, of your business? Uh, comparing to air, sea, and uh, railway? Well, we see uh, um, a clear future, especially for reefer containers in, in multimodal connections. Um, at the moment, um, we've had in, uh, several initiatives uh, to put reefer containers uh, for continental flows by train. Um, however, this is still a product that needs to be developed. Often, the costs associated by uh, trail, rain, sorry, rail transport, uh, including the uh, the first leg and the last leg, which needs to be done by truck, 
is uh, in the end more uh, expensive and less um, uh, fast as, as a truck transport. Uh, however, we do see that the, the demand in the market is growing for both rail products and uh, inland barges. So we also try to work together with rail operators, but also barge operators and shippers um, to promote uh, barge connections and rail connections um, to, for instance, uh, this could be in Holland, uh, let's say to the green ports in, uh, in Venlo, that's this one of the examples, uh, but also further into uh, Germany and, and Austria. Um, however, at the moment, it's still uh, a limited amount, I think about 95 or maybe even 98% uh, of the products are uh, transported by truck. Um, but hopefully we can uh, together work towards a more uh, sustainable future with more intermodal uh, uh, options. Oh, thank you, Annie. We got one question to Venlo. So yeah, uh, are all the new developed locations climate resistant? So is this taken into consideration about the climate resistant when we develop new uh, locations? Well, if we uh, build new warehouses, we always uh, look at, as we call it, the second life. So everything, in fact, is prepared to be conditioned. Doesn't mean that everything is conditioned uh, uh, at the start, but uh, like with insulation and the possibilities to put uh, uh, cool insulations in there, uh, that's always there. But most of the new developments, yes, they are conditioned. And that means uh, in, in our case, and we are working in the food and vegetable business, for companies in the food and vegetable business, it means conditioning of the uh, warehouse itself around eight to 10 degrees and uh, with uh, cool chambers, possibility minus one or four degrees uh, extra within the warehouse. But that really depends on the contract you are making with the tenant uh, and, and the more specific, the longer for a longer period you want to uh, rent, of course. Uh, but we also have smaller units with everything in it. So. At the park, about 70% of the buildings on the park is conditioned. It's conditioned. So if the Netherlands offer climate resistant um, transport networks and have, uh, hopefully that you will have a really major competitive edge in the coming 25 to 50 years. So it's really important. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think that like the hubs, uh, uh, Anna was talking about uh, uh, containers, like all the import containers are electric containers. And what we see also on a hub like this, uh, but also on other hubs, you have some points where you would change towards uh, intercontinental container to be able to go more forward into Europe or even to China, uh, what there are quite a bit of experiments going on. Uh, there are also a Chinese logistic company here in Venlo who are working on silk uh, route. So all, the, all kind of things are developing and with this new diesel electro containers, you can make that journey of 12, 13, 14 days uh, on longer tracks. Uh, so uh, the, all kind of things are developing uh, around that. So, and uh, also, can you please, uh, Jan, tell us more about Greenport, Greenport in the Netherlands. So, I know that there are already six green ports in the Netherlands set up already. So can you give us more information about it? The green port plan? Well, it, it, of course I can uh, directly only speak for what we are doing here, but the thing, and I put it also in, in, the, in the presentation, the good thing what the, the Dutch government, they said at a certain moment uh, more than 20 years ago, we should uh, look at some hubs uh, and uh, to consolidate and make good connections there. Uh, and, and of course, the most important thing still is in a green port, how can you take care that the infrastructure around road, rail, and if possible barge is, uh, is okay. Uh, so that's the good thing about the, the, the green ports in Holland where both the companies, the government, the local governments are sitting together and say, okay, how can we do that, uh, give that a good job? So I, I, can, I can say it again. So the question is uh, for Dr. Leo. Uh, climate threats for production as well as transport are growing. So what is your opinion on the potential of post-harvest techniques 
be helping to save a uh, have a cirrhosis and the setup uh, really the climate. I give the uh, microphone to my uh, my colleague. He is the expert to answer this question. Okay. Thank you. And I think I understand that the question is, what can post-harvest techniques do to reduce food losses in the post-harvest stage, especially in view of the climate threats which are coming up? Um, yeah. Well, and then I think in general, we should of course very much appreciate the post-harvest techniques which we already have today. That is all about reducing food losses. Um, but of course, there is always uh, room for improvement. And yes, it is one of the strategic research lines here in Wageningen. We continue to work on improving post-harvest technologies to uh, basically to avoid that quality decay occurs. And of course, a very important first step is have a proper cold chain there. Um, but Generating gold costs energy, so somehow that needs mm -hmm. to be balanced against energy costs. Uh, we are heavily involved in uh, research on modified atmosphere packaging to manipulate the gas conditions around mm -hmm. the fruit and uh, meat. That also helps to uh, prolong uh, the shelf life. But then you have a lot of waste materials at destination, plastic waste. We don't want mm -hmm. plastic waste anymore, but well, what alternatives are there? There is a lot of research into wax and coatings, which might be kind of replacements for the plastic materials. Uh, ethylene removal techniques. There are a lot of different ethylene removal techniques. Treatments of fruits to make fruit insensitive to ethylene. So yes, there is a lot of technological research going on there. Um, reducing food losses is one purpose, but we need to balance it against other sustainability goals. And then I think we should also appreciate that at some point it comes to behavior. Assume we have done all the efforts we can to bring fresh strawberries somewhere to a consumer in a Chinese kitchen. And then uh, in the Chinese kitchen, the strawberries are just put uh, somewhere on the table, removed from the packaging and cons consumers just leave them there for a week. Yeah, the strawberries perish. So there is also in the behavior of consumers, I think uh, a lot needs to be done there. Yeah. Another example, actually, what we are working on, we are, we are actively working in a project right now uh, on improving uh, the 45 foot containers, the diesel electric units mentioned by Jan, uh, which go on the rail to China, uh, that refrigerated transport is taking place. But we are working on establishing improved equipment to have better quality preservation in that new trade line on the Silk Road. But yeah, it's all balancing of different interests against each other. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, another question for uh, for Dr. Liu Zhen. So I think you have a lot of experience in uh, the cooperation between China, uh, China and the Netherlands industry. So. Uh, have you seen some trends in this? Uh, so have you seen uh, more and more cooperations between the Chinese side and the Dutch, the Dutch side? So can you share with some, some about your opinion, some it? Yeah, actually we, uh, for Wageningen, we were active in China for quite uh, a few years. And uh, we work a lot with uh, uh, food producer, especially the first mile of the chain. Uh, I think in between China and the Netherlands, uh, the first mile, there are big gap. And also the Netherlands is really strong in this field. We see nowadays uh, the equipment companies, technology companies, also as well as knowledge organization like Wageningen, we, we really uh, have a lot of uh, collaborations with uh, uh, this industry. I think uh, there are a lot uh, uh, we can complement with each other. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. So another question, uh, just go to another question for Jesper. Um, so Jesper, um, are there uh, are there possibilities to plug in wafers on 
for example, real and inland vessels? Yeah, that's a, a very good question. Um, uh, as Anna has already said, uh, the Port of Rotterdam has uh, quite an extensive uh, um, uh, uh, reefer infrastructure. And what we see is that more and more inland terminals uh, are also adding uh, reefer plugs. And uh, there are also some vessels that uh, start to connect them. Um, I know that uh, trucking is still the standard. Uh, but we see more and more examples uh, of uh, multimodal uh, um, uh, transport of uh, reefer containers. Um, uh, we see, for example, uh, prawns going from uh, the port of Rotterdam uh, towards the inland uh, destinations. Um, and there is a, um, if you go to coolchain.com, you will see that there is a train running from Rotterdam to Valencia three times a week, which is a dedicated train. Um, so we see more and more uh, different modalities and the infrastructure is adapting to support that. Thank you. And uh, another question about uh, air freight, air freight destinations. So can you give us some uh, information on the European locations and what is done by air? So uh, for whom, who is um, much air freight is already done by truck and the uh, airway view, so. Yeah. Yeah, if you look at uh, the transport in Europe, um, uh, many people think that when they send express shipments that they go by air by default. But Europe is not such a large geographical uh, um, area. So uh, most of the uh, time sensitive shipments, whether it's food or non-food, uh, is actually being carried out by road transport. Um, but if you look at what is transported by air, it's normally the atypical goods. So uh, luxury goods, um, uh, for example, there's a lot of fresh salmon being flown from, uh, from Northern Europe to China, um, which really needs to be very, very fresh. Uh, we see some air um, shipments around uh, public holidays like Christmas, um, but maybe the, um, you know what? Another thing that we've seen during the COVID outbreak is the uh, the booming of food e-commerce. So maybe in future, when we talk about food e-commerce and we talk about luxury items, atypical uh, food items, so not food that you can get from the supermarket, but something really special, I think we will see a rise of um, of uh, time-sensitive shipments. But whether they are done via air or road depends on what's more efficient. Uh, the logistics companies in Europe will always choose the most efficient, uh, and that is on cost and quality factors. They will choose the most efficient uh, transport mode, whether that was air or a road, uh, that depends on the, on the cost and quality factors. Okay, thank you. So um, I think the questions for today is all. I'll uh, give, uh, give to you. And uh, so thank you so much for your answering, answering the questions from our audience. So um, thanks for the contribution. Look forward to seeing you some, some very in the Netherlands or in China in the future. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.